In this video, we're going to take a look at different ways to build a Java program. Uh, first of all, let's consider how Java builds work. We typically start with our source code, which is a .java file. After that, we'll run Java C, the Java compiler. And the reality is, in all of the build systems I'm about to talk about, Java C gets invoked at one time or another. So the role of Java C is to generate bytecode, which we tend to think about as a .class file. That's the platform independent code that can run on Mac, iOS, or Mac, Linux, Windows, whatever you want. But we still have to convert it from this platform independent bytecode to machine language, or the zeros and ones that that specific operating system is looking for. So many times we'll use a just-in-time compiler, and that will compile it to native code, which that operating system can run. Now, let's consider the history of build platforms in Java. The most basic and the one that we started with and used quite a bit in the late 90s was Java C, which creates that bytecode. And as I mentioned, each of these actually does use Java C under the covers. It's just the further on down build systems I'll talk about here add additional value as well. So Java C creates bytecode from a .java file. It can be run on the command line. For instance, I have created this very simple Java program in Notepad++. And here again in the late 90s, this is what we used to do, is just use a text editor like this. I've placed it into this directory all by itself. So you see there's nothing there but this foo.java class. Now, I can try to run the program without compiling it. We'll see that fails. We get a message that says no class def found error. Now, let's try this again, but I'm going to compile it with Java C. Notice as soon as I compile it, we're going to get a second file in that directory, which is going to be foo.class. And we don't get any feedback here, which is actually good. That means nothing went wrong. And sure enough, you now see foo.class. Now let me run back to the command line and run this again. Now, uh, you notice it gives me the output, hello. A couple things to note here. First of all, Java C is the Java compiler. Java is the Java virtual machine, which knows how to run this. But we also have to make sure it can find foo.class. So I pass a flag, dot, dash class path, and then a period which says look in this directory for a file called foo. I don't need to add foo.class. I don't need to add that dot class. It will know to look for the dot class. As soon as I do that, it prints out hello. And let's take a look at our program, and we see sure enough it has a main method, and that main method simply prints out hello. So Java C we can convert Java to a class file, and then we can run it with the Java command. And this was ideal and worked for us for a long time, but we often find after we compiled, we had to package things up, we had to deploy things, uh, add a lot more value to it. So we have a couple of other options. First, a lot of IDEs like Eclipse and IntelliJ have their own build system also based on Java C, which is what we've been using so far. Um, I don't remember exactly when it came out, but I want to say in the around the turn of the millennia, probably you know around two thousand, a little bit after that, maybe two thousand four or so, we got ant builds, which were ubiquitous at the time because this allowed us to do some scripting as well. So an ant build is XML based and allows allows us to compile our Java program, but it also allows some scripting to do things like packaging up the final output copy files, things like that. So we could automate a lot of those post-compilation tasks. And we used Ant regularly for a long time. Ant did a lot of things well, uh, but then Maven came along, which allowed us to do dependency management as well. Maven is also XML-based, so we have an XML configuration file. But it's well-structured to have things like dependency management, where you can say that I require these libraries for my project, and it will download them automatically. As a matter of fact, it's very efficient at managing these dependencies because it puts them all into what's called an M2 directory on your hard drive. I, I found mine here. And these are all the dependencies that Maven needs for any project on your computer. So if you have multiple projects that require the same dependency, it will simply look in that M2 library. And by the way, if one of these dependencies gets corrupted, you can simply delete that folder in the M2 library and then run what's called a Maven update, and it will go and re-download those dependencies for you. So it makes dependency management uh, very simple. I could just pick any, uh, let's go with log4j here, and what you'll typically see is we can dig down, you'll see a version number, and then you'll see a jar file, where a jar file is essentially a Java library. So Maven adds dependency management, does a really good job of that. Uh, there's one other option that we see a lot now as well, and that's Gradle. 
Gradle offers a lot of similar features as Maven, the dependency management, also packaging your application and versioning your application. A uh, big difference is it's more JSON based, where Maven is more XML based. So the Maven configuration file is POM XML, where the Gradle configuration file is often build.gradle. And that works in a hierarchical form where you can have different modules that have their own build.gradle. So Gradle is used very frequently with Android development. So if you get an Android, you'll be used to this build.gradle file. But once again, if you have a dependency you need, you just put it right in the build.gradle and it will download it for you. As a matter of fact, many of the IDEs can figure this out for you. Now, uh, so far, we've been using the IDEs built-in builder. Uh, but I'm going to change this to start using Maven because it's going to offer us some advantages on GitHub. So with GitHub, we can do something called GitHub Actions, which is uh, if an event happens like you make a commit or you make a push or something like that, it can trigger one of these actions to run. And with the actions, you can have it set up to build your application to make sure that your application compiles. You can also have it set up to run tests on your application to make sure that if you're working on a large project with multiple developers, you haven't accidentally broken somebody else's logic. That's very important. I can tell you working in mobile commerce for two different companies now uh, that they tend to do weekly releases. So the app gets updated every week and you have a couple hundred people working on the app at once. So how can you have all these people making changes to the app and know that the app is still stable? Well, you can run some automated tests and Maven with GitHub Actions makes that easy. Uh, GitHub Actions is part of a bigger umbrella that we call CICD continuous integration or continuous delivery, continuous integration, continuous deployment. It goes by a few different definitions, but basically it means anytime we do a commit and a push, it's going to do these value added activities to make sure that our code builds, our product is stable, and our unit tests have not broken. So creating a Maven project in IntelliJ is quite straightforward. This is our existing project using the IDE's build system. We only have two classes here, so this is going to be fairly straightforward. After I make our Maven version of this project, I'm simply going to move these two classes over. The source code's the fit same, it's just a matter of how it builds. So to make a new Maven project, I simply say new project, and then we'll call this one vehicles. Vehicles 2022 MVN to indicate it's a Maven build. Note that before we chose IntelliJ, now Maven and Gradle are our two choices. So you don't see Ant on here. Ant was enormously popular for a while, but everything you could do with Ant, you could do with Maven or Gradle. So those are the two choices we have now, plus Maven Gradle. They do that dependency management for us. Everything here looks good. We're going to tell it where to put it. Uh, we're going to use JDK 11, so I'll go ahead and choose Create. You'll notice when this creates, it's going to have a little different file system than the IDE build that we're used to. So notice Source. Now we have two folders. One is Main which is where we tend to put all of our Java programming logic. And then another one is test, which we're going to look at in a lot more depth. That's where we're going to put our unit tests. So if you compare that to our existing project, a little different structure we have to get used to, but it's still a Java project. And really beyond this different file system, everything else will work the same way. Compiling, building, debugging. It's just going to use Maven under the covers. Now take a look at uh, pom.xml, and this is that... Uh, file I was talking about that will configure our project. This is one of the smallest POM files you'll see because as we add dependencies, this will grow more and more and more. Uh, we can take a look at this model version, group ID, artifact ID, and version. These are different parts of the Maven system. Now, I don't want to get into that in this video because this is just an overview video, but bear with me just a moment. I do want to brag just a moment. I've opened up Google Chrome Incognito and I'm searching on POM XML, which is that file I told you about. Let's scroll down a little bit and take a look at the first two video results. Uh, they're both videos I made a while ago on what is POM XML. So uh, if you're curious about what that artifact ID does uh, and, and the snapshot, the version, I'll point you to that video. It's about 18 minutes, depending on which version you want, but it goes a lot deeper into this uh, project here. So now I'm simply going to paste over that vehicle and main class that we worked on previously. Go ahead and add them to version control. And let's see if it still works. Yes, it should still work the same way as before. So I'm going to hit run. And we see after the build happens, we get our informational lines that say, 
in vehicles main and second line. Uh, what's the name of this vehicle? We'll say my truck. Okay, and now let's run our selected output with zero gallons of gas, 100 gallons of gas, so on and so forth. So uh, if we take a look at our main class, we'll see that we hard-coded in some values here. As a matter of fact, if I wish, I can go ahead and snap a breakpoint on this one. And this time I can right-click and choose Debug, and we'll see that, again, the debugger is going to work the same way as we've seen before, just that build system underneath has changed. But that's, you know, that's something we're only going to bother with if we need to actually work on dependencies. So step over in Vehicles Main, second line. Now we get our input. We see my truck. And now we can step over each line as it constructs a vehicle. It initializes the vehicle, adds that to the collection. Does that same thing for our second vehicle. Now it invokes the drive method uh, for 100 miles and for 60 miles. And now we see our output down here. So uh, we now have a Maven project, and this is going to allow us a lot of flexibility. So uh, I look forward to some follow-on videos where we'll see the other great things we can do with Maven. As always, I hope this video was helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.